Amen. Well, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 26 tonight as we continue our journey through Matthew. And if I had to title this, uh, and it, the title of it would be The Cry of a Father. And we're really not going to cover very much ground tonight. Uh, we're going to look at really one verse, verse number 18. It's going to be our, our focus verse. And we'll try to cover the rest or the majority of the rest later on uh, next week. But uh, as we look into it, let, let me go ahead and read this. And I have a lot of things that I want to say. And I was trying to figure out what I, what I could say. Amen. Because there's a there there's only a, there's only 40 minutes that I have, and man, it's a lot to cram in 40 minutes to be able to bring any justice about to what we're trying to get across. But in Matthew chapter nine, verse number 18, it says, "While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler, and worshiping him, saying, My daughter is even now dead." But come and lay hands upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with, the, with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. And she said within herself, If I may touch uh, his garment, but... I'm sorry, if I may but touch his garments, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that, from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the, the minstrel, and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, the maiden is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maiden rose, and the fame thereof went abroad into all the land. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you so much for your good grace and mercy. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that you'll help us tonight. As we look into your word, I pray that you give, give me clarity of thought of what to, what to bring out, what to say. Lord, you know my heart is uh, torn between uh, different things and, and unsettled, and I pray that you would just have your will. And Lord, I pray that, uh, that you would uh, uh, be glorified. Help us to grow in grace and truth and to see you in this passage, Lord, in a, in a special way. And Lord, uh, we'll give you the honor and glory of it. I do humble myself, realizing I'm just a man. And Lord, indeed, I, uh, there's, no, there's no place that man needs to be today. Lord, we need Christ. We need you. We need, we need you above anything else. And Lord, you need to be seen above any man. And Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord, we love you and thank you for all you do for us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the verse I want us to really, that we'll really focus on tonight is verse number 18. And we're not going to focus on uh, the whole verse, but just part of it. I want you to see that in this passage of Scripture, there's a, a, a ruler uh, that is there. And this ruler, he comes to Jesus, and there's a desperate need in his life. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss that in just a minute. But the the, the focus is on the resurrection by which takes place in this chapter that Jesus raises from the dead, that he has that power. And the gospel tells us uh, that this little girl that, that was there, that, that was being asked for by the ruler, that, that, that she wasn't dead at the time when Jesus, uh, when her father came to him. But through the process, uh, she died. And we'll see that later on in the Gospels as we continue our study. But 
This is a witness of, of, of Jesus and his credentials. He has given us the credentials that he has. You remember the theme that is given before us is that of the king. Jesus is, is reviewed as the king, the Messiah, through all of Matthew and the credentials by which he is, he is showing. And he is dealing here with this essential message that deals with the critical theme, and that of death. And why shouldn't he? Because we live in a dying world. We're all faced with the inevitability of, of death in our life and, and around us. Uh, the decay of humanity and the decay of this world is focused around death. This death in this world is marked with, with uh, tragedy and sorrow and sadness and death and, and dying. And it's all because of sin. Since the fall of man in Genesis chapter number 3, the curse that's been upon this earth that has inhabited and spread disease and pain, sickness and death throughout its touch. In fact, we're all faced with these things every day. It is something that we come in contact with. But this is life, a part of life. It is what sin has done to this world. And it is the working or the action of the curse working before us as we can see it plainly. The Bible describes it, and we all know the story well, Lazarus. When Lazarus died, that he came and, and there he saw his, uh, uh, Mary, his sister, uh, Lazarus' sister weeping. And Jesus was moved with compassion and he, he wept. And his, his, his heart was breaking. Many people believe it was breaking because of the fact that the, of the, the sadness that was on the sister or the, the sadness that was there at the, at the, at the uh, gravesite. But I myself believe he wept because he saw the hold that, that death had upon man. And how in this type of in this time that he looked, that he could see with his mind's eye back to the very beginning of every death that has taken place because of sin. And groaned within himself. He was sympathetic to the depths that sin had and death had upon mankind. And even they said, isn't this the man that healed the blind? Could he have not touched this man and he not die? Truly that saying is true. And it never was God's plan for the world to be created to be in sin. God created it for good. And sin filtrated it. And today, the Bible says that sin bringeth death. And death is upon the land. God will one day turn this around. And we get a glimpse of that in the book of Revelation. As we see the millennial kingdom being brought forth, that there'll be no more pain or sorrow in that land in that time. There'll be no more death to, as far as those that die because of sin. He will exercise power over all those things. The animals will lie down together. The curse of the earth will be done away with. Prosperity will be everywhere. And the curse will be reversed for a thousand years. And Jesus came to this world to demonstrate that power. To demonstrate who he was. To reveal to all those that were around who he was. 
And as we have been going through this study, we've seen that he, uh, he abolished disease in Palestine. And he's risen the dead and forgiven sin. And all these reveal that he is the true and glorious king. He is the one. And he has demonstrated this in his first coming. And that is what the miracles verify to us, that he has the power to reverse the curses. He has power to establish his kingdom. John chapter number 5, he says this right here in verse number 26. He said, for the Father, uh, he says, for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to exercise judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is come in which all that are in the grave shall, shall hear my voice, or shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation, he is the one that has the power of that. The power that is demonstrated before us. Now, it is tremendous what Matthew is revealing to us for example, he reveals this in chapter number 4, in verse 23, and through verse number 25. It says, when, And Jesus went about all Galilee, and teaching in every synagogue, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, and all manner of disease among men. And the fame went out. He went through healing all those that were diseased, all those that had devils that were possessed, verse number 24 says, that he, he, he healed them, he cast them out. You go a little bit further in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 8, and verse number 16, it says, in the evening was come, they brought, him, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirit with his word and healed all that were sick. You keep on traveling down just a little bit further in Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 35. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and, and every disease among the people. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 15. The, the blind, he, he gives us, this understanding to, to, a, to the, the disciples of John. He says, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, uh, <clears throat> and the leopards are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have, been, have the gospel preached to them. He demonstrates throughout all of Matthew his power, his power of being king, his power of being Messiah who he is, and that's what Matthew is trying to tell us. He starts out with his lineage, that his lineage is king, and then he starts out about his, his arrival, that his birth is that of, of, of a virgin-born son. Then he tells about his adoration, that the kings came and bowed down before him. Then his, his acceptation, the Old Testament prophets, Fulfilled uh, prophecy was fulfilled by his birth. His royalty uh, was heralded by, by John the Baptist. The herald came to preach. Uh, prepare yourself for the Messiah has come. He affirmed that, uh, who he was through the Father as he spoke at his baptism. He overcome the adversary at the temptation of Satan. He told all about the activities of, of healing and, and preaching. And we're told about his authority in, in the sermon in, in uh, chapter 5 through chapter 7. 
and gives him the authority that he had. All these miracles that take place were to prove one thing, that he is king, that he is the Messiah. And we have been going through and looking at three sets of three miracles. That means they were, there are three sets of miracles, and in each one of those set of miracles, there are three miracles that take place. Matthew gives these groups of three. The first group of miracles uh, dealt with diseases. And that is in chapters 8 and verse 23 through chapter 9 and verse 1. The second group dealt with uh, discord, both of the physical, spiritual, and moral world. And this is, now we are looking at the third group where it's going to look at and deal with death, disease, disorder. And this is the claim that Jesus came to raise the dead. Now this section of these three miracles, uh, the first one, in fact, is a miracle that's inside of a miracle. We see two miracles that take place. And as you read it, you, you see, as we read it, you saw that there was a man that came and he was asking Jesus to help his daughter who was dying. And then on the way to there, a lady touched the hem of his garment. But I want to focus not on neither one of those miracles just right yet, but I want you to see something about the tenderness and the sincerity and the gentleness and the openness and the loving kindness of our Lord. He, he has all power that is given and, and yet he is available. I mean, this is, this is our Lord Jesus Christ who is working on this earth and, and he expresses his availability to all that were there. The verse that we're looked at in verse number 18, it says, while he spake these things, as he was speaking these things, well, what things was he speaking? What was he saying? What was he talking about? Well, if you'll remember back, they were all together and the disciples of John that came in and wanted to know why he wasn't fasting, why they, why they didn't fast. And that is what was being said. The question of fasting was upon the lips of, of him there. Now I want to remind you that the fame of Jesus that had just exploded. You remember they were on one side of the, the, the Sea of Galilee and they crossed over to the other side and there they met Two that were possessed with devils. They cast them out. Or he cast them out and sent them into the swine. And they ran off. And then he immediately went back over to the other side. And there he healed a man with a palsy. That was let down from the roof. You remember that? Just nod your head. I don't understand. And then the next thing you see, you see Jesus, who was walking along and, and found Matthew. And we can read and place the, the setting that, that after Matthew had received Christ, they, he threw a big party. And that's where the disciples came to Jesus, or came to, his, to Jesus' disciples and asked him, why does your... Why don't, why don't your disciples fast? But in the midst of all this, his fame has grown. I mean, he is, he, is, he is constantly with people all the time. He is there, and, and even in this portion of Scripture that we're given, if we, if we mark it with all the other Gospels and put it together, it says that he was pressed. 
that he was, that he was confined in as he was walking through the, the crowd. And she touched the hem of his garment. I mean, he, to the place that he would say, he would say to his disciples, uh, who touched me? Because everybody was touching him. I mean, the disciples said, eh, I'm, what do you mean? I mean, we're so crowded in this place. Everybody's touching everybody. But I want you to see the availability that Jesus had. I mean, he was on his way to heal somebody, but yet he stopped for a moment. He was not one that was afar off. He was not separated from sinners. Matter of fact, he was the one that was accused of eating and being with sinners. He didn't have some ivory tower that he stayed in or, or stayed at arm's length from those that were the down and out. He didn't live in some monastery somewhere far off. He wasn't one that you had to go to the third vice president and send it up the chain to get to him. Come here, John, let me, let me tell you something. And you can tell Peter, and then Peter can tell Jesus. We have some religious people today that believe that we have to go through that. Amen? Let me tell Mary, and Mary and tell Jesus, and Jesus to tell God. I'm grateful that he was never like that. He was among the people. He was there with them in their streets. He was in their villages. He walked their dusty roads. He preached in their synagogues. And he lived in their homes. He was accessible. I'm so grateful that God's, that Jesus is accessible today also. He's not far off. He's near. He said, the Bible says that he is that one that sticketh closer than a brother. He himself said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I mean, even in, in, in Matthew chapter 19, if you'll remember, just, just uh, I know you've heard it preached, uh, where the, 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 the mothers brought their children and they, they, were, they were wanting them to be blessed by Jesus and the disciples sent the children away, and Jesus stopped and said, don't hinder the children to come unto me. He was not just available to the adults, but he was also available to the children. This is, this is overwhelming understanding that, that in all that Jesus did, he never, never turned anybody away. He was always available. Sure, there were times when he had to go off into the, to the mountaintop to be alone with, 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 uh, with God and to pray and, to, and to, 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 to be alone. But can I tell you? His desire was to be with the people. With the people. Could you imagine being in that crowd? I mean, could you imagine being in that crowd? You're, it, it's probably going on uh, almost like three days that they've, they've been around Jesus. What would you do if you were around Jesus? I mean, I, I, I mean, just don't you just think, can you just imagine all the questions that were going on? I can see Miss Honor going, could you tell me about this? What do you mean when you said this right here? Now, I looked in the Old Testament, and I didn't find that. I mean, can you imagine? What would be the first question that you'd ask him if, he was, if you were walking in the midst of him? I mean, these people were, were, were looking for answers. Some of them were looking to stump him. Some of them were looking to betray him. But there were some there that were looking to know more about him. On the vast variety of people that were, here, that were there in that, that place at that time. I mean, you had Pharisees. You had, you had scribes. You had rulers. And then you had, you, 
You had leopards. You had those that, could, that were deaf and dumb. And, and you had those that, 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 were, that, that were just there because they heard of all that had taken place. the master of the world, the creator of the universe, the king of kings and the Lord of lords were walking amongst men. God himself were walking the rolling hills of Galilee. Could you imagine just being in that group? Children running all around, people stopping and asking him questions. As he walked in their villages, and walked by their seashores, rode in their boats, and pushed through their crowded streets. Can I tell you that he was accessible? There are two other people that were there that are in our focus. There was a ruler, and then there was a sick lady. There was one that was kind of up in society and there was one that was definitely down and out. There was one that was wealthy and one that was poor. And there were so many others that were there pressing to see Jesus, trying to find out who He is. Now, I want to take just a few minutes because I only have a few minutes. I want to take just a few minutes and I want to look at this, this ruler. It says, there came a certain ruler to worship him. And this is a remarkable statement. Because when it mentions here that, that he's a ruler, he is, he, he is the ruler of a synagogue. He is the chief uh, elder of the synagogue. Not the one in Jerusalem, but the one that is there in Galilee. He is coming to Jesus. Now, I, I, want, you to, I want you to understand the, the depth of sacrifice that this man is making coming to Jesus. I mean, the, there are those that are Pharisees and scribes that are in the midst of the congregation that is there around him, and he is one of the rulers, not at the temple as in Jerusalem, but he is one of the rulers of, of the synagogue that is there local. And when he comes forth and acknowledges who Christ is, he is making himself publicly seen as, as one that accepts him for who he says he is. It says that he worshipped him. The word means that he, that he fell prostrate before him and possibly kissed his feet. For that is the custom of that one that would be worshipped. This man cared not anymore about him his status in society. He didn't worry about what people thought about him anymore. There was something that happened to him that, that caused him to put all that aside and to believe that Jesus was able. And I tell you, there has to be that in our lives there has to come a time in our life when, when we're willing to put away everything that, that's outside of us and everything that's pressing us to believe Jesus 
is able. And he was at that place. He simply said to him, my daughter is now dead. But if we take him, we correlate to other scriptures concerning this one incident here. We know that when he first arrived, that he is, he tells Jesus that my daughter is dying. And in the process of time, he comes to know that his daughter is dead. So when he showed up on the scene, there was hope in his heart and there was belief that Jesus could heal his daughter. He was amazed that he was willing to give up his status of being ruler, chief, leading elder of the synagogue. And that he would believe that Jesus was he that was divine, holy, the true king, the one who was able to do that which no one else could do. To lay hands on her that she would live. What a remarkable statement could you imagine the social pressure that he had upon him the prestige that he must have forfeited his rank in religion but the care of his daughter brought all that to a screeching halt as he trusted only in the, and having faith in that Jesus was able to heal her. He had to swallow his pride. He had to push back on, on the pressure of the social society. He had to say goodbye to religion. And came and fell before Jesus. Can I tell you that's the exact same way that we all got saved. We had to say, swallow our pride and say, Lord, I'm just a sinner. We had to say, I don't care what everybody else thinks about this, I'm going down to get saved. We had to say, it doesn't matter who is religious because I need Jesus. We have to come to that place. And this man did. I believe that he was a true believer in the Lord. Because he was he was willing to sacrifice all. All that he was. That Christ could be revealed as for who he is. Now, I want to, um, I want, I want, I want to, I, I really, I really want to stop right there, because this is the the established of where Jesus is. But as he walks to this man's house, something miraculous takes place, and I cannot cover it. In five minutes. There's just no way. So let's stand together. And we'll look at that next week. Father I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your goodness. Your grace and your mercy. Lord I pray God that when we read the word. That it would become alive to us. And Lord, it wouldn't be just words on the page, but that we could be able to sense the things that are taking place and the the sacrifice of people that are around, that that are there, Lord, and, and what it would be like. That it may be applicable to our own lives. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us as we continue our study. Lord, that you would show your goodness and grace. And Lord, that as we study throughout this week, Lord, that we will look into these passages. Lord, that we could see your, your availability to those that are around. Lord, I'm so grateful that you're available today. For anyone who would come to you, Lord, you're, you're there. You said that if, if, if they would come, you would in no wise cast them out. You're there waiting. Lord, can I, can I even put it this way, that you're, that you're sitting anticipating someone to come. Lord, I pray. I pray that if there be one that's lost, that hears this message, Lord, that today would be the day that they would find you available for them if they'll only come. Lord, I love you and thank you for all that you do. And ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jeff, what we're going to say.